significant difference between the practice of medicine. Yeah. Do you, I mean, well, I mean, that article is just specifically about that. Who wrote it? It's from a, a book. Get Never trust anything <laughs> that, first of all, is called getsign.com <laughs> or <laughs> in, their little, from a book. in their blurb says oh. they're the tr most trusted anything. There is an excerpt from a book. Well, so this is, this is the type of fodder that, that will be on the test. Um, but I mean, the, the three things that, that I've always kind of defined as, as the essential qualities of a manager are passion, connection, and capital, right? So, I mean, I think if I can, Corey, um, understand where you're coming from, you're saying that, that these types of artists require uh, a different type of manager than a indie rock band. Thank you. 
Because you can use it for free until you get to a limit, like a wall where services stop, and then you have to pay for it if you want to get any, anything beyond that. Other example. Rapidly, sort of, yeah. What else? Rapid share. Blah, blah, sort of. Who, uh, who just said recently that they're changing their business model to a premium model, not music business? New York Times. New York Times, explain it. No, uh, they're web, uh, they can get the news in their web edition or whatever, it's free for them a while, but they track how many times you use it, and then after a while, you have to pay for it. Okay. So, how does this relate to Little Wayne's mixtape? He puts out mixtapes for a couple of years, and then he drops his album. He starts typing out the album on the mixtapes. <laughs> the mixtapes are free, right? He's giving you the mixtapes. He's allowing people to share them at their will. Start giving them, but then at a certain point, he puts out a record and how did it do? Awesome. Million copies per day, right? I think that was the thing. Is that average or is that a part? What's that? Pretty fast, a million records. So, this idea that why would somebody buy the record if they could get it for free didn't really pull a lot of water in this situation, right? So, he essentially took the mixtape. We're always we call kind of non scarce, right? <coughs> you know what I'm saying? Want one, you get one. You want 
pay for it, you're not going to run out. And he used those to get the scarce goods for the record, but also what else? What else is given away all these mixtapes together to the scarce? Sorry? Tickets, what else? Uh, 
person who's looking for, uh, who's trying to discover something new and not insulting or boring to your daily visitors. You want to hope to encourage daily visitors. And I think that's where I get on this idea, what are they going to use daily, right? My, my little thesis that I've been developing over the past year or so is that if you're an artist, you need to, you need, when people come to the site, <coughs> you have to say, okay, here, here's what you get. You can listen to, to my music here. I think you need a pop-up flare that can then, you know, you can close the page, and still have that flare playing. We're, you know, we're in front of our computers non-stop. We need somebody to give us the theme for our day, the music for our day. We need something that, that people come to the site, okay, I'm gonna get that thing, and then come back tomorrow for a new thing, and I'll give you a tangible example. So, you guys, some of you know this site, right? You've all heard me talk about it. Uh, so over the, over the course of, of the last year, this site has gone in traffic-wise from about three or 4,000 visitors a day to now it's averaging between 15 and 20,000 visitors a day. Massive, massive growth, right? And I, mean, I analyze this to death, right? Every day I look at the Google Analytics, I pull them apart, I study it daily. What people are doing by coming to the site, and every, just so you know, those of you who aren't familiar with the site, every day this changes. So tomorrow there will be another featured band, and then these will kind of rotate out, right? So you're constantly getting something new. And what people are doing is they're coming to the site, downloading their four songs, right? And then coming again the next day. More people are coming every day. But the, the way I know it, and you guys are all familiar with Google Analytics? You've got to make Google Analytics your best friend. Yeah. Is that right? No, that's not right. No, you can. You can install it on WordPress. I have a WordPress blog, but but you're, you at like WordPress.com slash daddy whatever. No, you definitely can. Yeah, you can. I I've heard that if it's if it's a WordPress not a WordPress they install it off of their site there probably. But even that I doubt. No, right. you, you you can install it on WordPress blog, but you definitely can. It's just your domain. Yeah, I do it. I mean, I have it. So anyway, so for anybody who doesn't know, doesn't want to raise their hand. Google Analytics uh, puts a little piece of code on every page of your site, and then allows you to track visitors. Is it perfect? No, by no means perfect. Um, but <coughs> it presents you with a ton of data about what you can see from site to site, and I'll, I'll show you in a second. The heat maps are incredible. That alone would be just worth the price of doing the, the time, I mean, by heat map, I mean, they'll show you where on this page people click most, right. or the hottest spots on this page, what, what the time somebody spends on a page is. I mean, the, the amount of, of data and, the, and, the, and the, the, the granular nature of the data is amazing, and it's free. And that's to my point. If you do a heat map on this site, this is red, okay? Because everybody goes here. The time on site, as Billy said, is about four minutes. How long it takes to download those four songs? Exactly right. And we've just seen it go crazy, right? The part of it is getting getting banned, care about whatever. In any case, there are lots of sites out there that have more content, and many would argue better content than what Sean gets, and yet the traffic on the site is just going through the roof. And I think it's because you know exactly what to do when you come here. Well, part of it is that uh, I would say part of it is that he is an excellent curator. And not only an excellent curator, but their offering is so uh, stylistically clear. They're, they've, been, they've been consistent, and yet they bring variety and consistency. I don't know how they manage to do that. So, you know, with, with sort of a magical formula, but they do, they, they have been incredibly consistent while being incredibly varied in what they offer. That's amazing, it's an amazing combination. You know, I, I mean, the content is key. I, I, the <coughs> one is, hey, not all this is very current, you know, but you know, there's a lot of searches for Spoon, right, right. Bonnie Bear, right. you know, uh, of Montreal. I mean, that's stuff, Death Cab. These are not current, <coughs> that, the traffic is coming from those, from those bands. Well, and, and again, I know, the, the point I want to try is that if all of you, if you have a website for your band, how many of you all have bands with no website? Yeah, at some point, you're going to have a band, and you've got to figure out a website. And I really, really want to drive the point to home, drive the point home of clarity 
you in thinking of your customers as users? How are they going to use the music? And I'll give you a counterexample of something you know, that I also work on that is not, in my opinion, doing it the right way. So, I'm going to pull the date out of right now. But um, I don't know what to do with this. Right? There's so much stuff going on. <coughs> know what you want, if you're familiar with the site, you know you want live music, this is probably fine. Where you're going to go, right here, right? And just put a search in it. All of this is totally redundant. If you don't know what to do, where do you even start? Right? And I think this looks like most sites on the internet. Just cram more stuff on there, right? Get as much as you can. And, and it, it just doesn't work. Uh, You know what I mean? Take a look at this. You're thinking through what, what your site has to look like. But it, seems, it seems like the issue, and maybe you guys agree, but the issue might be just the offering. Like, you know, we'll get involved in a lot of stuff. It's merch, it's photos, it's posters, it's music, it's screens, it's downloads, it's, you know. They try to simple sort of thing. Simple, simple, simple. simple. The whole thing is the offering is simple. You know, there it is. And I, mean, I love that one that's one of those things in you know, good to great. I hope you guys agree. Simplicity counts for an awful lot. And, and I think that we get we have this overwhelming <coughs> tendency to throw up as much stuff as we possibly can. We've gotta have a blog, We've gotta have our updates, <coughs> gotta have our photos, gotta have our video, gotta have all this stuff. You know, I'm not saying that stuff can't be on the site somewhere. It's all has to be on the homepage. What is going to be on the homepage is going to get somebody to, to do what you want them to do. And what do you want them to do? Right? And this is where I'm going back to, you know, <coughs> with your conversation about hip hop and mixtapes and things. What is the thing that's going to get people talking? What is that thing that's going to get people sharing stuff? It has to be back to appear here. Just for the record, I don't know how it's going to come out, but what Kristen's saying she wants on home page, the most important is three columns. One, all her free music, no player, player, player. Another one, her writing, down the center, and then a column of Kristen with that. The parts of the daily phone club. Uh, I, I don't know if that's how it's going to go. I hope, I hope we're honing in. Right? <laughs> They 
would, you know, they could um, strong arm anybody into doing their bid or into, into complying with their terms. They they would um, they, they would they would use strong arm monopoly practice. Uh, and now they're going to be more able. It's even more frustrating because when you've got so many things where we're doing treating direct to customers, and, you know, you want to want record, I think it's fine, whatever. Let's sell right from your website to your fans. <coughs> and you can certainly sell tickets right to your fans, but they're still going to get you at the venue oh, yeah. And that's where, that's where it's terribly frustrating. For artists, if you guys just stay, you know, go play house parties, go play not, take a meeting, <coughs> that ain't. But once you get into a place where you're playing theaters, or you, oh, yeah, you, you, you get incredible resistance. You, you play a club that has a picnic master contract, and you will find them too and nail to get a percentage of the capacity. <coughs> My artist always always asks for 25% of capacity and it's murder. Murder to get 25% of capacity just to sell ourselves. Um, well, we ask, uh, if a venue holds uh, 1,000 people, we ask for 250 tickets to sell direct to our fans for no service charge. So they can escape the service charge so that we can sell direct to fans so that we can make sure that people get things from home. We had we a lot of complaints over the years. Why do I pay $17 for a ticket and $9 in service fees and you don't see the service fee? I mean, the Ticketmaster, con the Ticketmaster deal is a, is, a, is a very disturbing and terrible deal. The, the fact is that money is being siphoned out <coughs> of your pocket and being shared between Ticketmaster and the promoter of the gig, just so that they don't have to share that money with the artist. They take, for instance, it's a $10 ticket, and there's, uh, let's say there are $8 in fees. The, there's a kickback to the promoter, so that promoter may get $3, $4 out of that. And Ticketmaster takes $3 or $4 out of that. That, um, that $8 in fees is coming out of your pocket. You won't have that to spend on a CD or on a piece of merch at the gig. And, under, uh, and the $10 that you're paying for the face value of the ticket is, is is, is subject to a split with the artist. But that eight bucks in fee isn't. And they can hide money that goes straight into the promoter's pocket and keep it away from the artist, even though the artist has instigated the purchase. The artist is, what, is why you bought the ticket. And they're keeping that money away from the artist's split. And that's why I find it That's why I find it so offensive about the way these deals are put together and these backroom kind of kickbacks. They're, they're, they're getting worse and worse every year, and more and more money is being taken from your pocket where there's less and less artists anyway. And it's being, not only is it being taken from you in the artist's name, but it's not being shared with the artist. So this is why Ticketmaster can't be so <coughs> and, it, and it squashes any, not any, it squashes a lot of up and coming bands. It just never gives them a chance to even get their foot in the door. Uh, well, I think the chance is <coughs> like staying away from yeah, house, house shows, house shows, block shows, you know, alternative spaces. Just have to take a master to that take a master. Yeah, if I wanted to start a venue and didn't want to make a contract with Ticketmaster, could I do that? Absolutely. And Absolutely. Print yeah. on tickets. Ticketmaster preys on your weakness and <coughs> convenience. Ticketmaster wants to sell you their net their nifty machine. They want to sell you their database software. They want to sell you the, and, and, and once they've got you using their stuff in their venue, you're then on the tip. You're then on, you're, you're, you're hooked. Because then they can pull that if you do something that displeases them. And that's how they hurt. Uh, just a long story short, I owned a ticket agency that was artist owned and generated proceeds uh, from, the fees were shared with social services. And we fed the hungry. So that every gig in every city that we ticketed was a benefit to the community. And uh, the fees were low, they were all shared with the community uh, in the local, you know, in, in the local market. And um, we would take 20% of venues capacity, you know, for, for these alternative sales. And all we wanted was to be a choice. And anywhere we were a choice, we'd sell out first, uh, and then Ticketmaster sales would begin. Or we'd sell out first and then box office sales would sell out and then Ticketmaster would start to sell their tickets. Nobody wanted to buy from Ticketmaster. But what Ticketmaster started to do was threaten venues with the removal of their equipment. With, uh, I, had, I had a knitting factory we bought from 
knitting factory was off the knitting factory the venue in New York and Los Angeles. We've taken the knitting factory for six years. We saved their lives a couple of times, which was ridiculous. And uh, Ticketmaster came in and offered them $250,000 in marketing money. And knitting factory needed it. And they, they left. But other venues have been threatened with Ticketmaster coming in and taking their printer away. They're going to take the ticket printer away if you don't stop selling their tickets. So not only were we driven out, Communities lost out in this case, and the artists who prefer to use us weren't allowed to use us, and ultimately they starved us out by by, by diminishing the amount of the allotment to what's called a hold, the ticket hold that we were allowed to sell was cut down and cut down and cut down, pared back, and venues were stolen from us over time. I think what's interesting, I, say, I think what's interesting about this competition is, is that you know five years ago we could have had that competition about pretty much every aspect of the yeah. you know, radio festival. Now, what else is this, really? See, this is the yeah. last, last holdout from that era. Yeah. Which is good. I mean, yeah. you know, I wish that would go away, too. And the I only mean, reason I, there's a holdout is because of the physical security. It will. I mean, it started to when TicketWeb started. <coughs> TicketWeb, Ticket Web, I don't know, you guys probably still buy tickets from TicketWeb. They're Ticketmaster now. What happens don't to, believe they're what right. happens to Ticket Web? TicketWeb was bought by TicketMaster. <coughs> Andrew took $35 million the minute he was offered. But it, it was somewhat, somewhat offensive to me. And it, as a matter of fact, it was responsible for, for my ticket company getting its start because uh, TicketWeb had postured itself as the anti-ticket master, <coughs> as the the, um, the 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 good guys, the, the low fee independent ticketer, and they made their name that way very rapidly. And they did a big interview in Wired magazine, and the ticket master came along and said, "We like your business model, 35 mil," and they took it and they shut it down and put it right up underneath. Right, you know, right inside Ticketmaster at the wholly owned subsidiary. And um, it alienated all the people who actually cared about TicketWeb's independent ethos and, right. and TicketWeb's new model. It alienated those people. And they started calling us. We were doing fan ticketing. We were doing direct to fan ticketing <coughs> through our website. And we were asked if we could start to do many tickets. And Slimmers in San Francisco, Great American Music Hall, the Knitting Factory, all these people were offended by and decision and asked us we would be a truly independent solution for, the, for them. And we ramped up as fast as we could, and we did it for seven years. But, you know, there was a, you know, there was that curve. We did very, very well. We had lots and lots of things, and then we caught them. They're only going to let you get to a certain size. We got their attention. They're going to buy you or, or put you out of it. <coughs> once we got their attention, and once they realized there was no hope that we could be bought, they started killing us. Little by little, they got, you know, they were a cancer. Yes. Don't they, they keep a certain amount of tickets that they release just to ticket brokers, oh, yeah. scalpers, who then turn around and put it on StubHub, and then they take 3% off of that. It's just so immoral. I well, there's, there's, there's a good deal of like collusion between ticket brokers, resellers, you know, scalp, what would be called scalpers in any other time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not that but their hold is only because of those physical venues. Yeah. If you can avoid them, you can avoid the system. I can't express five years ago we could have done exactly the same thing about distribution from yes. the radio. Yes. And, and the radio, okay. all these things that now we just don't, you know, we don't care. And I do hope you're right to well, take that to go that way too. Well, what I was going to say is like that all it'll take is is that is, is, a, is a stronger, better innovation push. It'll take somebody selling you Keypad like the one from Lou Dixie that you have on your keychain that has your buyer information on it, and they installing readers at all these venues. It'll take some capital right. investment that says no more of this bullshit. Well, and, and I mean, look, you can make a comparison to the business world of you know, five years ago, no, five six years ago, no one ever thought. Well, the government stepped in to break up my like, yeah, yeah, right. The government said, look, you can't bundle your Netscape browser with your thing. It's too integrated. You're not giving choice. Blah blah blah. And nobody ever thought that anyone could pop the Microsoft and do that. Who? Apple. Google. Google came in and they said, you know, this this these rats. The first way they did it, I remember saying in the front of class, was, you know, when uh, when you wanted to search something on your on your Microsoft operating system, you could control F and type something in and go through the back of the screen. And Google gave you a free download. But all there, you can 
search your desktop, then they introduce Google Docs, then they introduce Google Presentation, then Google Sheets, all these things, free, and they work better. I never open Microsoft there, there are ways to topple these giants, and it's going to take it's a little tiny company yeah. that way. Hard for people to remember. <coughs> yeah, and the thing is that there's, there, are, there aren't that many. I mean, there were, there were people who didn't like Microsoft, but there is, there, there, no, everybody hates them. Everybody hates them. Yeah. Everybody hates them. Everybody resents them. Everybody sees their face value almost doubled by their fees and convenience charges, things that, that don't make sense to anyone. So someone will be motivated enough to make it happen, and that's, yeah, you're hoping it's you. Charles Meach, that's where you want to say. So HP got a, got a happening new venture here, it sounds like, huh? Yeah, what seems is it? pretty silly. The subscription service, uh, along with Omniphone, where you pay. What the hell is Omniphone? I don't know. You pay nine pounds. It's only in Europe. You get unlimited downloads, uh, but only as long as you're paying the subscription. But, and, and each download is wrapped with some DRM, so oh, yeah. you can't yeah. play it unless you're, you're paying. But Fail. every month, Fail. every <laughs> month you get to uh, you get to unwrap kind of those downloads so you can keep them. <laughs> As complicated as this model possible. Yeah. Aubrey, <laughs> Spotify, successful overseas. We know that. What's the problem with uh, the US release? Spotify. Tell us about Spotify. <coughs> Who here has tried Spotify? What do you think? No. Have you tried it, Aubrey? No. What do you think? Sorry, I've got one from Spotify. What is it? What? Nobody else has used Spotify? Have. What do you think of it? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Spotify is essentially, well, they would like it to be iTunes in the cloud. Okay. So you go there, you type in, a song, you search for a song, any song you want, you can play it, no, no DRM, you can rewind it, you can keep it, you know, but you're streaming it, you're not downloading it. You can just have a pretty nice user interface where you can store your hours and everything. Um, I, I was not terribly impressed by no. it. I didn't think they didn't have half the content that I thought they would. Right. Um, it was a, a nice UI, but not killer. Uh, but for whatever reason, they are the great saviors of the music business in Europe, apparently, where they're legal. They've been threatening to launch in the States for a year now. Right? It was supposed to happen in 2009. It's not happening. Why hasn't it happened? I'm just wondering, um, I really only one. There's no other reason. The technology is there. 
they, they, you know, they want to be in the states. They want to have an iPhone app in the states. They can't do it. They can't get the, get it, uh, the, the deals in place they work. Lala sold for exactly that reason. You know, they can't make a business model. I don't know how Moz is not just every day. Anybody use Moz? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I like Moz well enough. You go to stream any song you want, you pretty much pay five bucks a month or something. Yeah. How would they not get to Moz? I don't know. <laughs> Just for the tune core are selling lots of tracks. Um, and 
as he says here, under Tommy's model, none of these count as album sales, right? And then he talks about, you know, 42 million songs. You know, so there, there's stuff in selling, it's just not being picked up um, by SoundScan. So some interesting comments in here. There's an artist, uh, um, yeah, that's where I was going to go. Yeah, you, guys need to, you guys just need to read the comments, right? This, this, this whole discussion is important for you to be aware of. So orient yourself to some of the issues. So Zoe Keating is a, is a, is a cellist, and she is doing very, very well. So one of those examples that, that you know, we point to, um, Billy and I, or at least I do, I think do too, is somebody, you know, because people like Tommy Silverman will try to keep you down. They will try to say, you need, I guess, me, Tommy Silverman, to get you to a major label to validate your career. And you can't point to any example of the virus. Well, here's one, right? You might know the sound scan numbers about the whole picture and say, so what? But I recently had a conversation with someone near Todd uh, who had no <coughs> idea that unsigned artist sales were not tracked by sound scan. Um, and she goes on, you know, she's trying to get the industry to evolve a little bit. She's doing very, very well. I also think that part of the issue is, is that sound scans are already two months, but now yeah. So Billboard Magazine, this is Zoe speaking, last year, uh, for an artist with a niche audience and total sales of 16,000 for a 2,000 plus sold album in a 2004 EP, according to Nielsen. She was missed because those numbers are digital sales uh, via iTunes and are a fraction of my CD sales. By my reckoning, I sold 30,000 copies, but I'm not allowed to report them. Of course, Billboard is Nielsen. They're owned by the same company. Uh, I thought I'd make an effort uh, this year to get all my sales reported by SoundScan. You know, <coughs> but, but then they reply this way. I love the response. The only store will be, uh, uh, the online store will be able to report to SoundScan once there are at least 12 artists with albums available for purchase at all times. Accounts are only assigned to record labels to report venue sales. The record label must be in business for more than two years. All this stuff, <laughs> and not letting her do it. Right? So, you know. To your point, yeah, go ahead. Why should anybody care what the owner of Tommy Boy says? I don't know. I know. I mean, you know, you don't want to see my response. Well, you know, no, I mean, yeah. what, why, what's the threat? It's, it's like having... Uh, he's, he, he's invested in you buying into the old structure, into the legacy business thing. You know, I mean, he founded the New Music Seminar. And he, was a, you know, he, he was part of the old business, but the fact is that... Um, it's, it's like having the CEO of Chrysler tell me that you know, you the yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, I know. Who listens to it? Yeah. So I just said, I'm not sure how more clear I can say this. The music is business is over. Right? <laughs> the problem is that Tommy Silverman and his ilk, with all due respect, don't want to admit this because they don't know what else to do. That's the only explanation I can come up with. Some combination of fear and greed is driving the misguided and frankly damaged attempts to try and convince people that rather than innovate and expand markets, we should instead of oil and continue to adhere to practices and metrics. Uh, that by any rational mass measures do not work. Refusing to innovate and expand the market is okay, I suppose, on a personal level. Companies and business do it all the time, and they live a lot until they're made obsolete. Tick master, who do innovate, right? And this is why I get mad at Tom, because they keep charging people for this so called advice. Uh, I think it's discount, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, when I talk about the, the Conan Leno thing, and I think, you know, this is maybe the only relevant thing, and I feel bad about saying it because Conan's last show was very nice. And I agree with him not to be cynical. I need to learn how to be better with that. Um, you know, but given the choice between watching Jared Cohen and the vast majority of young people will opt to watch something online, right? So, you know, all of this stuff, we have to get out of the system. I mean, you guys are wonderful. I mean, you're up there, right? Why would you care? And yet, you can't imagine what people would do. Now, you only get not to care if you propose alternatives. Absolutely. We, we chose not to care about SoundScan back in 2004. We had to decide whether or not we wanted to report any sales, whether or not we wanted to try to get a, a friend's company to report sales of the CD we did. And we decided we didn't want to care anymore. We were just going to take, the, take, the, take a deep breath and do it our, our own way. The only trouble is that Zoe's issue is an issue that we face as well, which is this, there's still this weird perception out in the world that, that these are numbers, these are the real numbers. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, well, um, you know, somebody will write an article about one of my artists and they'll say, oh, but this is according to SoundScan, you know, like that's the official record. And it's ridiculous. I mean, we sold 10,000 PDs ourselves and we see 2,100 reported. Um, but uh, it does, you know, we just had to make a decision not to care. And, and take care of ourselves. <coughs> and deal with 
got to be the one to do this. But, you know, we can't wait around for somebody else. We're all going to do it like that. You're, you're doing it. People go, oh, like that. Well, it's scary and it's hard. And, but, but sometimes, you know, you know, I've said this before, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And it's, it's, it's true all the time. And the minute your livelihood is at risk, if, you know, by, by, by relying on someone else, you're going to figure out a way to do it yourself and to make sure that you're looking at your own business, taking care of your own business, looking at your own numbers. Well, that, I mean, so what, you know, uh, somebody's got a uh, part of the relation to that. Uh, Jason, Van Metric, tell us about Van Metric. Uh, it's for more cars to use as many as I could. Make your music and 
be what you're going to be. Walk your walk, and you'll attract the people who you attract. And you don't need everybody. You just need a slice, a small slice of everybody will do you fine. Yeah. Um, let's take a break, and then we'll talk to the manager here.
and you get to this kind of level of virtuosity. And I was thinking as the blood was being taken out of my arm today, after the woman missed my vein, like 15 years ago. I'm so bad with that. I don't like needles, I don't like product paper, I like, but, uh, don't like, you know, blood generally. So I'm sitting there with Monopoly on my iPhone. <laughs> God go, tell me when you're done, right? <laughs> Trying to play, do my little car around and buy a ball to gather, right? And she just keeps missing, you know? And I was like, what is your problem, right? And so finally, she goes, hey, use my other one, right? And so finally she gets it. But it, 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 made me, it made me think back to several years ago, two and a half years ago, when little Henry was six months old, and he had to go, to, uh, to get his, his allergy and he had to get blood work done. So we took him up to Children's Hospital in Boston. Now he had the arms, and he was a big guy, but he still had the arms for six months. So I sit and uh, I sit him on my lap, and he doesn't know what the hell's going on. And they've got to take out quite a bit of blood from a six month old baby. And they hold the arm up, and the whole thing around him again. He doesn't really know what's going on. Big, huge dude sits down, and you know, I, of course,
they, they don't know the person, the person doesn't know them, the person doesn't know they exist. The person, that, like me, I didn't know there were people who did that in the hospital. They say a prayer to the person. They're artists. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you, that even though nobody knows they're there, they're lynch, they're lynch mates. They're definitely lynch mates in that, in that organization. There's something, in the, you know, that guy who wakes up and, and has to go take blood, that, it, it's the intangible, the invisible thing that makes him a lynch mate. Not the fact that he's saying, I'm going to go draw kids' blood. Well, I mean, it's an one is, you know, you talk about how I heard over, he's a level five leader, the humility, right? And the dignity is great. They're doing it in a lot of out that thing. Think about, I mean, you hear it, it's a cliche. Well, what I wouldn't give for a great mechanic. When somebody finds a great mechanic, sometimes they won't tell other people because they don't want to get a positive. My friend Ian, who wrote the top he found some sushi place in LA. He will not tell people where it is. <laughs> won't do it because he does it's that good and he knows okay as soon as I tell people this they're gonna but there are artists at every level and I think I mean the, the scary thing is you know what was it Sam's Club just laid off twelve thousand people today. Twelve thousand people like those Sam's Club. I mean this breaks my heart, right? You're working at Sam's Club, you're probably not psyched to begin with. How are you getting let go? Right? None of those people were linchpins. I mean, that's the sad kind of social Darwinism that we live in. Those people were all expendable. Sam's Club said, you know, for reasons of efficiency or whatever, goodbye. If any one of them had been a linchpin in that organization in some capacity, it is it possible that one was? Of course, right? We gotta find that thing. And so what Collins helps us to do is he comes up with this, this idea of the hedgehog concept, right? And it's a deceptively simple kind of Venn diagram, I guess, right? Where you have to look at your three circles. And in one circle, you have your money, right? The second circle, Collins calls it passion, I call it purpose, whatever. And then the third circle is what you can be best at, right? And the reason why I say it's deceptively simple is because you're forced to make choices. You all as musicians have heard all of your life, you are a great musician. That thing you play is great, you're great at it, right? And yet, you can't find a way to both be the best, clearly, clearly you love it, certainly if you be but you don't get where you are without being passionate about it and being the best. If you can't do this, both of these go away, okay? And you can do this with all of them. You can be deeply passionate about something, it kind of sucks, it ain't gonna work. You can be deeply passionate, be the best, not make money, that won't work. You can make lots of money, be the best at something, but have it not be your purpose, and you will jump out of your Wall Street office. It happens. You've got these investment bankers that just don't know how to do anything other than make money, they're great at it, right? They make fortunes. They are miserable. The amount of, of uh, Wall Street traders that are in therapy is crazy. Right? No, I'm not joking. And so you have to find this alignment. And what it does is it forces you to make choices. And sometimes they're very hard choices. When you find that overlap, Colin says, magical things start to happen. And I think it goes back to this, this artist thing that, that Seth Good is talking about. He's saying that there's in fact an inverse relationship. That once you get into an organization and try to become really great within the confines of an organization, which is how historically business have operated, go to work, work your way up. And that's really working. It's very much in this kind of mindset of the only way you can be happy is to find that thing that you love, that you do, and you do it. It's an extreme stance. And I don't think he's wrong, particularly today. And as we wrestle through this kind of hedgehog you know, approach, you've got to do it for your music. And this is something, you know, Maggie, I don't mean to figure out, but you and I just kind of butted heads on this. Because, I don't want to work with that. But, but my sense is, if you bring commerce into things, you sometimes feel as if it's, it's degrading the art. And my, my response is always, 
Yeah, but that commerce allows you to keep making it. And it's an uneasy balance, okay? But, it's, you know, one, you got, if you're living it, you need the money. I mean, you need the money. I mean, the, the first thing that happens when money doesn't, when money is not resident, is you become demoralized. And eventually, the art dries up. Because otherwise, you know, what are you doing? You're, you're working at the coffee shop. How many hours a day? How many hours a day are you actually working on your art? How many, how many hours a day are you able to focus on your own thoughts and be a quiet place? You know, the money makes that possible. Where are you in your life? Absolutely. 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 And, and you know, another, another writer that, that I think that I have a like is the guy who's cloud. He talks about you got to have your sexy job and your money job. And your sexy job is the music that you make, and your money job is the job that you make during that time of your life while you're trying to build your thing. But the goal is ultimately to unite the two. Your sexy job makes your money. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't ever happen. But so when we look at, at these companies, we look at these institutions, and, and what they tend to have, good companies, not good companies, you'll start to see these Right? Larger than life celebrities. Now think about Ticketmaster. Right? Sazoff. Okay? Irving Azoff, manager of the Eagles. Um, there's all sorts of nicknames for him, but he's, he's an ego egomaniac and he'd probably be okay with me saying that. Right? The only person who ever said to me, don't you know who I am? <laughs> right? Actually said it for real. I know exactly who you are, Mr. Azoff. I still won't like you. When I was a kid working in a rock club, I know him. I was working in the door of a rock club, and I was a fire capacity guy that went in, and he stomped his feet. Little, little tiny feet, yeah, tiny feet. And he said, Don't you know who I am? And I said, I know exactly who you are, Mr. Azoff. He said, Well, let's go. Let me in. And I said, No, I'm not going to We're going to have you out here anyway. That's great. Exactly. Right? And so, what, what we think about it, and in the book, this is why I'm going to kind of read it, because a lot of these things on the surface <coughs> seem very simple. So the idea of larger than life celebrities, I mean, you, you're looking at two people that just have a general bias against that type of person. But there's also a business reason for why a, a larger than life celebrity isn't such a good thing, and it comes down to the fact that they tend not to set their companies up for long-term success. <coughs> they can't imagine their company going on after they're gone, right? They don't, they don't want, they don't want anybody to think it could go on. Exactly them. right. They want to, they are so important that when they leave, they have to give everyone the impression that, well, the only reason that exists is because of that guy. Well, think about that. You're managing a band. You get the band going pretty well, and for whatever reason, you leave and you set up some system that the band fails afterwards. No, it's crazy. People from the outside brought, being brought in to run the company. I mean, the, the record industry, Lord, yes, right? They intend to bring in, this doesn't mean outside the industry, it means outside the company. The record industry is just a revolving door. You work at one company for the one, and you run it, and they just go in and out. And <coughs> the same people going to different companies. Never works. The part of government. Government, yeah, of course. Look, I mean, you know, it's a music business class, but this all absolutely applies to other, other industries, right? I know the music business. When you have the government, you can see bureaucrats. <coughs> and bureaucrats have a, have a, I mean, going back to the first one, what now, you're in charge of, you're in charge of, uh, your bureaucrat in charge of uh, curing swine flu. <coughs> what happens if you cure swine flu? <coughs> you're out of a job. So what incentive do you have to cure swine flu? Zero. Uh, so compensation driven by performance. Again, this is one of those things that on the surface seems pretty obvious. Well, you know, it's, you, you're driven by your passion, right? It's, just, it's a proven thing <coughs> that entrepreneurs do not start businesses for money, right? And once you tie that quote unquote performance, things get all whacked out. You, you manipulate the system. Nothing is more true of that than you know, the government or the, the uh, financial markets, right? Those guys will manipulate the market to make their bonus every time. You think it's a coincidence that they're making these massive bonuses even as the stocks are losing money? They know how to do it. 
doing. Um, lack of understanding of technology as an accelerator is a key, key kind of chapter in the book. So technology as an accelerator, this means that it's what you put into technology. I think this becomes more important every day. It goes back to what I was trying to say. I don't think I articulated very well with regards to the website. Mm -hmm. Right? You'll see companies, and you'll be, you'll be tempted to do this yourself. Oh, there's this new tech. I need to use it. Now, I am as big a tech geek as they come. I will try just about anything tech -wise. But understanding that you only want to use the tech as a way of accelerating whatever it is that you're doing already, because if you don't, it will accelerate you down. I think that's what Billy was saying about how, you know, in today's market, nobody cares about you. And that's because with, with, with the technological innovations, anybody can jump into this market. Right? So if you're bad, if you're using it the wrong way, it's going to just drive you down. So if you tech in, in, in the service of your philosophy, in the service of your overall goals and objectives, in the service of it, it's like that as a slave is always the best way. Anytime you that the, the offering for tech is not going to work. That's exactly right. And, and but people fetishize them. People have long careers doing this. We both know where you know they always know what that new thing is, and they will fool people into thinking they've got the answer. I'm asking you to strip the heck away from right? Use the right tech. Have your website have a purpose. Okay. Uh, I don't think it's in mergers and acquisitions. Probably not something you guys have seen yet, but it will. Record labels do this too all the time. They, they justify their existence by going out and buying other companies rather than developing their own. Okay? <coughs> Deal with this all the time. All the time. That is, you know, people at a certain executive level justify their existence by, okay, I'm going to go buy this company. And essentially all they're doing is buying some time. Because they present it as, okay, once we get that merger done, then things are going to be good. Working a long time. So then you live off of that. Um, programs to motivate you. You can't. You can't. You guys ever been through one of these things? You ever worked at some place where you have to tell me about that? How'd that go? Uh, it didn't last. Like, I, I was at a restaurant I worked at, and they were trying to motivate us by, like, if you were the best employee, then you got, like, a token and you'd save your tokens up for some shit that they stopped after, like, a couple of weeks. And then people, people, people for kind of feign enthusiasm at the beginning because if they don't, they're going to yell that, and then nobody does it. And then what does that say about the culture of the company? It sucks the work. It just gets worse, right? Who else has been through anything? Yeah, I love these examples, by the way. Yeah. Company you're doing, that 
could be a problem, right? The program to motivate demarcation events, right? Well, we've reached this out of the other thing, you know. Uh, proclivity to chase hot industries. Hello, music business, right? Now we're gonna get into this, we're gonna get into that, you know? <coughs>
rather than the next three years, was to plow all of our capital into this, into this flexibility with our confidence, to have flexibility with our confidence. We are all lost in that with regard to decisions we make concerning confidence. And, uh, you know, yeah, I think that um, not understanding tax is an accelerator. I mean, yeah, it, 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 you can use any bell or whistle. And, you know, it, three, four years ago, you didn't have flash on your site. You were, you, you looked like a lie. There's no way I wanted flash on my site. You know, skip this intro to me and skip this site. Well, it, it's, it, and that's important because it seems that's, that's exactly the example of tech as a negative accelerator. Yes, Flash looks cool to some people. Google can't analyze it, so your Google rankings go down. As you say, you got some skip this in, or look, we're going to skip the site. Yeah. And yet, site after site, the help you must have been site after site. Manager, what I hope you in MA is, you know, sign, 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 sign. I had an artist manager say to me, I said, do you actually like things? Because, like, I was asking my opinion. I said, well, I don't know. What do you think? Do you actually like me? He said, I only have to like until 6 o'clock. <laughs> I was like, wow. Same plan, different world. Like, you know, mergers and acquisitions. Just sign more arts and get everybody working at the same time so that I don't even know. Maybe you have five arts playing five different shows. Maybe you're 15% there. Well, that's friend like Yeah, exactly. And many others. Unhealthy interest in programs to motivate my That's <laughs> uh you know, maybe it's just adopting the next, the next best idea, the, new, the, new, the newest, the newest idea in that case. You know, oh, you gotta have a, uh, you gotta have a blog, or let's do something. Uh, I don't know, just sort of this, this next, next best practice. Um, I think coming back to what is the future behind your problem? Who are your problems? <laughs> Where are they? Is all of these things making those two things? Happen? I keep going back to Daikawasaki. Make meaning and do something, right? That really it continually boils down to those two things. Just do something meaningful. Where is the most demoralized? It, it, the most demoralized I get in this business is when I'm doing something that is avoided meaning. Because that's the perfect thing. Where right? that's the thing that gets you out of it. And when you don't have that thing, what sucks, right? So great companies on the alternative. They have leaders that have humility and will, right? Which is a weird kind of paradox. Somebody that, that's humble is often associated with will because they're not out there broadcasting it all day long. Oh, look at me, they're busy getting the job done. They've got this first who then what mentality, which, you know, it's taken me forever to learn, but I very strongly agree with. Oh, that's, that's a big one. I think it's a huge one. Um, we found that making a decision is not based on first who's and why is a recipe for hell. Yeah. It's hell. It's hell. It's hell. You yeah. have the wrong people around. You know, uh, I think I told the story in one of my other classes. We made a decision about a keyboard player based on the fact that he was funny. Brought a keyboard guy out on the road because he was funny because that having that sense of humor told us that he had a sense of intelligence or value. Yeah. And real and real he was with yeah, our values in line. And we knew that we could apply that. We can put them into something and make them. You can teach them to play the damn song. You can't teach somebody to have a similar sense of humor. And be able to live on a bus. Be able to live on a bus together. Yeah, right. Um, the Stockdale paradox is is uh, confront the brutal truth but never lose faith. Okay. Last night, I Twittered that out about I got so tired of, of people quoting things about the music industry and the problems with it or whatever. Look, are there ways to make money in the music business? Absolutely. Can everybody make money in the music business? But if you believe that you can, the first step is to really honestly look at the reality. You know, it's super hard out there. I don't mean industry where it's not. I, I want to go to there. Right? I don't know where that industry is. Are there, easy, are there easier industries to make money in? I guess. But there's a certain arbitrage that happens where when something is easy to make money in, the hordes go there. And it's not so easy to make money. I don't know where these mythical industries where the money is just falling from the trees. <coughs> but you confront the reality. The reality is, is that, you know, there are a lot of artists doing this. There are a lot of artists out there with websites. There are a lot of blah, blah, blah. Can you still succeed? 
Saints game last night was the most watched non Super Bowl event since the Seinfeld. Uh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's good. Yeah. Even though, according to Nielsen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. everybody else was watching, but Sonny and Philadelphia on Hulu. My, uh, <laughs> my, my family's house was chosen as a Nielsen rep representative. <laughs> they just put a box in box. the back of the back of my house. When I was in college, my friends and I were, they gave us a crisp dollar bill. And I'm not kidding about this, a dollar and a bunch of forms to fill out. We filled out them and we spent a dollar. When I was a kid, I had a headgear that had a little computer box on it. Uh, braces, uh, had headgear, and it had a little computer box on it that would tell it how, how, how many hours I wore the headgear. <laughs> and I figured out how to put it on a seat. <laughs> All right, so, so just, general, yeah, just general management philosophy stuff. Okay, this is, this is what you would get in the attitudes and beliefs about people, work, action, and organization. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, I'll post them, but the problem with that thing is that, that uh, I'll post all the slides, and as you can see, I'm kind of skipping around, so when it comes time to study the test, you're really going to want to like, take some notes so that you don't just go back to the field one. I've got hundreds of slides, I'm not going to put them all. Okay, all right, so let's go to achieve objectives by working with and through non-managers. Again, I, I, I promise you I will not push too hard on this stuff, but just to give you a little bit of, of context, because I think people do make the mistake that artist management is somehow different from managing anything else. And again, that's usually I mean, there is. So, you know, what, 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 what do my managers like, you know, you have organizational objectives that you design, you have a plan, a business plan for your artists that you're pursuing, right? Who are the non-managers? You know, no band. Yeah. <laughs> the band, the core manager, their publicist, their accountant, their, their, their attorney, their, you know, uh, business manager, anybody, anybody else you guys are working with, uh, or, or to be able to have to manage. So, uh, this is a, uh, he defines management as the art of getting things done through people, right? 
this, this pushes you back to the first two this one. And um, I think next week we'll, maybe we'll go through a management contract and talk about those elements. Um, but you know, the, the process of sitting down with a band or a group of people, whatever you're managing, and hashing through this stuff is really, really important. And you want as much as, as, much as possible these goals to be participatively set. So even as manager, you're, your job so often the time with band is to lead that horse to water and get them a drink. <coughs> Make them think that it's their idea. You can't, as manager, come in. You're going to be filled up with, you know, some would say jargon by the time this class is done. You cannot sit down with band and go, okay, guys, we're going to discuss the demi site. It won't work. Right? They'll look at you crazy. <coughs> you have to have that in your head and go, okay, what does this band care about? You think about the psychology. Once you figure out what the band cares about, then you retrofit it to go, okay, let's put it into a language and a term. I also think you need to internalize the demo. I am a little mad at you. Go ahead. Manipulative. I knew you were going to say that. I said what the band wants. That's No, consensus. Sorry. That's fine. how I got That's all. That's manipulative sexist. No, I, I, the manipulative part I get, but, but I wanted to, and I didn't make it clear. It has to be a participatively set thing. All I'm saying is it's about the presentation. Figure out what the band really wants to do. You manage <coughs> have to go and have systems and stuff that's going to bore the tears out of those bands. Yeah. If, the, if it doesn't bore the tears out of those bands, great. Then you all do it. You know, I'm just saying from experience, most bands are going to go, you know, I just want to go play my guitar. <coughs> Shut up. So, you know. But I think that this stuff has to be has to be internalized to the point that it's second nature, to the point that you humanize it, to the point that you can communicate it to the point that it's in their best interest. Right. And I've never been good at that. It's just this just has to become part of your DNA. It should be what you do anyway. And it should be like, well, you know what we gotta do next? We have to do we have to do this, but let's do it the right way. Let's do it this way, this way, this way, this way. This way. First this, then this, then this, this. And when you do that with a the band, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's sound reasoning. That makes sense to us. Best way forward, let's go. And, and you're great. I'm so careful. I, I can't. I have a hard time getting into that zone with the band where it just feels like we're all. I'm thinking about it through my training, or whatever. They're thinking about it through theirs, and then we unite. You know, and, and I just, you know. or where you're translating. Yeah, I always feel like I'm translating, but that's part of the process, and I don't, I don't think that's effective. And that's where you get it eventually. Another question I have is that, like, it seems like you can't measure a lot of what. Not true. You got it. I just, you know, I just thought that goodwill. How do you measure goodwill? Oh, you, you can measure goodwill. Well, it's all measurable. You can measure goodwill. You can measure intensity. There, there. So you have to find ways. To I mean, if, if, if things are so intangible to measure, then it's really hard to kind of know, values those types of things. But then you need to find other benchmarks that show that the values <laughs> align and that allows you to get to this place. I mean, what what do you call passion and heart or whatever? Okay, so how many gigs? Well, here, let me give you an example because this is I come back on this all the time. I I say we haven't said this yet. My mantra here for this class has to be: I will not manage the band that before. You, you can't do it, guys. Out there that you're risking, and you know that that kind of performance 
<coughs> is so risky. You've got to be willing to demonstrate that, that willingness to put your ass on the line. Except for Brian Wilson. Yeah, well, you know what? Anyone in here that's Brian Wilson, get in your sandbox and start creating, right? You know, we need it. But there are always going to be exceptions. But they, the Beach Boys tour were limitless. It's one of the reasons why he went nuts.
notice here, it's the organization's goals, not my goals, right? We, band, and manager come together. We want to do this. We set this as our goal. It's my job as manager to try and keep us on track of those goals. If the goals change, fine. Not, this is not manager here, hierarchical as you say. <laughs> the best management relationships aren't. That's kind of what, that's sort of my comment on every on every one of these. We're all on this together. We're on the same side of the table. But I can see how it can be perceived as otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so modern organization, behavior of members and effectiveness of the organization. Yeah, keep Going back to the organization, right? You are serving the organization. And this is why the humility thing is it's not about me. It's bigger than me. You have a fiduciary duty to the organization. I mean, none of it has to be sneaky or, or power play. Questions? 